Okay, hi there and uh, welcome to this fifth in our series of six videos looking at the key diagrams for your microeconomics. Video five focuses on market structures. Perfect competition first. Uh, I think the key thing here is to draw a double diagram showing the market on the left hand side which of course is the sum of individual demands and supplies for a homogenous product. The market sets the price, the firm individually is a price taker. And in the right hand diagram, we can see here the firm is making some supernormal or abnormal profits at the profit maximizing output. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, you read the question carefully. There could be a question asking you to show or analyze a loss making firm in perfect competition. If the firm is making a loss, then it'll be a net exit of firms from the industry. In this situation, there's a net entry of firms, so the market will tend to adjust towards a long run equilibrium. The entry of new firms causes an outward shift of supply, which drives the market price down to P2. And for the firm on the right hand side, this representative firm, one of many in perfect competition, price P2 is just sufficient, just sufficient at output Q2 to make normal profit. Price equals average cost at that output level and of course price also equals marginal cost at output Q2. Monopolistic competition is a market structure taught by some exam boards. Uh, and keep in mind when you get a question on monopolistic competition many students either write about monopoly or perfect competition but not about this one. Here we have many firms each of whom produces a differentiated product and that gives them some pricing power. Although typically we tend to draw the average revenue curve, the demand curve, as price elastic, reflecting the large number of substitutes in the market. The short run diagram is illustrated here. In this situation, the firm is able to make a super normal profit at the profit maximizing output Q1. This tends, other things being the same, to bring about the entry of new products into the market. Markets tend to get saturated with products coming in, trying to compete away the profits. In that sense, it's a form of hit and run competition. And we assume in the long run, this process finishes when the average revenue curve is just tangential to average cost, where at the profit maximizing equilibrium Q2, the price P2 equals average cost. Just normal profits are made because the entry of new products, new differentiated goods and services, competes the profit away. So that's monopolistic competition. Monopoly, different types of monopoly, of course. This would be a working monopoly, a firm with any significant market power, perhaps more than 25 or 30 percent of the market. Downward sloping demand curve. You could draw it as more inelastic. That would allow you to increase the price relative to cost. The monopoly is a price maker. They can set the price in the absence of regulation. Although, of course, the monopoly is always constrained by their demand curve. They can choose the price or the output, but they can't choose both. In this situation at Q1, price P1 is much higher than the unit cost C1. So the monopoly is making a high level of super normal profit. Now, of course, in the long run, <coughs> in a competitive market, pardon me, new firms would compete away some of that profit. But in a monopoly, they're able to use barriers to entry different types and descriptions to maintain the level of super normal profit. Uh, quite important to think at some point to think about the economic welfare and economic efficiency implications. Here's a nice little diagram which uh, we've drawn in the past, making a, a comparison between perfect competition, where the entry of new firms drives the price down to cost, P1 on the left-hand side there, compare Contrast that with a monopoly, where in the long run, because of barriers to entry, uh, the price can remain well above cost and they can continue to earn and enjoy abnormal so-called monopoly or super normal profits. A nice contrast there. Now, we'll come on to economic efficiency in other videos, but you would probably then talk about the welfare loss due to a monopoly. There's also a case called the natural monopoly, natural monopoly, when there are very, very high fixed costs of providing a good or service, typically a network industry such as water or perhaps power networks or perhaps a rail network. And in the case of a natural monopoly, the key part of the diagram is that the average cost per unit in the long run continues to fall. 
that means there are some significant economies of scale with long and marginal costs, pretty low and below average cost. Uh, this is a slightly modified version of a natural monopoly diagram developed because sometimes you get a question about nationalisation. So, for example, uh, if this nationalised industry, instead of profit maximising, where MR meets MC, if this industry was required to price at marginal cost, where AR meets MC, long and marginal cost, then in fact uh, losses would be made. So if you're pricing at P2, then the loss would be made because the price P2 is less than the cost per unit. Uh, so there could be a risk of economic losses if you have a big natural monopoly. One of the aspects of monopoly you'll need to revise, make sure you have some good notes on it, is price discrimination, the charging of different prices to different groups of customers for reasons not associated with cost, I'm assuming here the marginal cost of supply to each market is the same, but to do with differences in, in particular, the price elasticity of demand. So typically price sensitive consumers on the left hand side charge are charged a low price relative to the high price that consumers with an inelastic demand are willing and able to pay. Now, some diagrams expect you to put the third diagram in where you merge these two average revenue curves together. I haven't done it in this situation, but check to see what your exam board says on that. But here's a nice clear distinction between inelastic demand, where the price is higher, compared to price elastic demand on the left hand side, where the price is lower. And there's also a form of other uh, pricing, in particular not uh, off peak and peak pricing. Here's a, here's a way of showing it. Uh, on the left hand side here, you have off peak demand for things like cinemas and uh, what have you and events and um, you know, and theme parks and that kind of stuff. So off peak demand is low and price elastic, whereas at peak times demand is pretty high and price inelastic. And of course, there's also a marginal cost implication. So at peak times, you may have to put on some extra trains or some extra overtime costs for staff, or the system comes under capacity pressure of some type. So the marginal cost is likely to be high relative to off peak times when there's spare capacity. So you have a peak price, which is high, and you have an off-peak price, which is low, uh, to use up the spare capacity. Now, not every exam board, as we move to oligopoly, uh, has, to, has the kinked demand curve model in their answer. So if you don't have the kinked demand curve in your syllabus, in your specification, then you can quickly move on from this slide. However, if you do have the kinked demand curve, this is the preferred, I think, the correct diagram, the developed diagram, the developed diagram to draw. So you have the kink in the average revenue curve uh, at that uh, particular price there. They have a kink in the average revenue curve, but crucially, uh, you also need to draw it in the marginal revenue curve as well. Marginal revenue, of course, twice the gradient of average revenue. So with the kink demand curve, you get a discontinuity to a gap in the marginal revenue curve. And in this situation, even if marginal cost goes up, there may be no change to price. The King Demand Curve model predicts that you have a period of price stability in an oligopoly, even if costs change. And of course, the firms in the market are going hammer and tongs at it in terms of non-price competition, marketing, advertising, branding, product differentiation of all types and descriptions. So there's your kinked demand curve diagram. That's the one to draw. The key takeaway point from this is you need to put the marginal revenue curve in to get the higher analysis marks. Uh, it's always important to have at least one example of game theory in your revision notes. Ideally, one example of price competition and collusion, which this one shows, and perhaps an additional example of a non-price game theory, how much firms should spend on advertising or research, for example. But in this situation, in this game, uh, this is the, the, the case, of course, that if firms were to collude, if firms got together and they agreed a high price, then they could both earn three billion dollars worth of profit, joint profit maximization of six billion. But in fact, it may well be a Nash equilibrium where they have an incentive to undercut each other. They both have an incentive to charge a low price because in that situation they could conceivably earn five billion. Um, but but if they both charge a low price, then they make a total profit of two billion, which is less than if they colluded. So the high high price. Both of them with their own higher total profits, that would be pretty optimal. But of course, even if they did agree to collude, there's an incentive then to cheat 
and break the agreement. But for the exam, please make sure that you have a really good, simple, clear price theory um, matrix table. Effectively, it's a diagram, isn't it, that you can use in your exam. That's really important to use game theory. Uh, you can also go one stage further if you want. Not everybody gets taught this, but you can use a cartel pricing diagram. Very quickly, on the left-hand side, you have industry demand and marginal revenue, and you have industry marginal cost. So the industry as a whole, or the cartel as a whole, maximizes profits and output Q1. And then they charge a, a high price P1. That then becomes the cartel price. You go from left to right. And then each firm is given a quota to produce. So let's say this is firm A, has given costs. The dotted line is the cartel price P1. They're given a quota and output limit. And at this quota level, the price is greater than the cost. So we can show the profit that this firm makes. But of course, the key evaluation point is that that might be a maximum profit for the cartel as a whole, but it's not maximum profit for the individual firm. And in fact, there's then an incentive for the firm to increase output, perhaps a little bit surreptitiously, hidden increase in output, or go above their quota, increase their production. And if they can sell at P1, well, they can make some extra profit. Now, if that's true for all for one firm, it may well be true for all firms in a cartel. As a result, cartels often collapse. So there's your cartel diagram, if you've covered that in your lessons. Uh, contestable markets, finally. Very, very important. Market contestability is one of the hot topics of the moment. And typically, you would use a downward sloping average and marginal revenue curve to show this. Very, very similar to a monopoly diagram. So Q1 is the profit maximizing price, P1. And you can make a hefty profit there. But of course, there could be the threat of competition. So if you have the threat of firms coming in, hit and run competition, they may well choose to price below P1, perhaps even as close as P2, where, of course, they, they maximise their sales, they make normal profit, but in a sense, there's less profit, therefore there's less risk of, the, of new competition coming in. So typically, if the threat of competition is very high, they'll tend to price at P2, bigger output Q2. If they think they can get away with a, a high price, if the threat of competition is low in the market, uh, then they'll tend to charge a price closer to P1. Finally, uh, price capping, of course. You may well get a question on price capping where a regulator may intervene in the market. So here's a monopoly. The normal monopoly price is P1 and they're making a pretty hefty, sizable profit there. The regulator may step in and lower the price, just insist on a particular capped price, in this case uh, shown in green. And they can still make a profit at that capped price, but comparing with the profit before, a price cap in theory, in theory, causes a fall in the total profit of the firm. All everything of this, all of this is in theory, of course. You need to think about how firms actually behave in the market. So perfect competition, monopolistic competition, monopoly, oligopoly, contestable markets. This is a big core part of your micro theory. And I hope this video is a rapid journey through some of these diagrams. I hope it's been of a bit of use to you. So thank you.